Okay, um, I'd like to uh, give you a little background about the assistive technology and the disability identity. I asked my wonderful co-workers, who will be introducing themselves shortly, um, to do this presentation because I was concerned that I often hear from um, professionals or people with disabilities that they are concerned about having um, assistive technology that no one will know that they're using it, that they um, will know that then that they have a disability. Um, I don't think that AT, uh, it's, it's necessarily always possible to have the very best AT to meet your needs and have it be inconspicuous. And I'm concerned that by only showing people inconspicuous AT, we're really doing them a disservice by not meeting their needs on many levels. And I hope that once you've um, heard the presentation today, you'll understand w some of why I think that. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the microphone to your presenters today. And I'll be one of the presenters today. I'm a program manager at Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. You can switch to slide four. And I'm Melinda Hawes Johnson, um, and I work here with at Michigan Disability Rights Coalition with Catherine and Teresa. So we are going to, um, I just real quick want to also say that when Catherine said that um, she'd be using the chat area on the right hand side of the screen, she really does mean that and we really do mean that. Um, normally we, Teresa and I do this presentation, it's very interactive and we have lots of activities and discussion. And so this is our first time doing this without having much um, interaction. So um, it would be, you know, just great if you could be patient with us and also use that chat area to give any thoughts that you're thinking or ask any questions. And you already went to Today, we are going to be, as Catherine said, we're going to be talking about disability identity, pride, and power, and why that's important and how it relates to assistive technology. Uh, we really need to look at changing the way that we think about disability. Um, once we go through a journey and a philosophical shift in how we view disability, that's when we as people with disabilities can really start um, having more acceptance and learning how to take pride in our disabilities and the assistive technology that we might be using. We can advance. So um, normally when we start out, um, we like to do an activity that really looks at our identities, um, things that really make up who we are. And this is kind of, as I said, difficult to do without the interaction piece, but it's really important for the rest of the seminar. So what we're hoping that you can do is to sort of just think about, um, take a little moment to reflect what makes you who you are. What are the various identities that you have? You can, um, if it's helpful, you can think about writing them down on a piece of paper. You can think about um, how you might draw that. But think about things that make you who you are. It could be your gender, your race, your ethnicity, nationality, sexual orientation, your religion. Um, those are all just some examples. And really think about that. And if you're comfortable um, and you are up for typing in some of those things that make you who you are in the chat box, that would be great. For example, I know I am, um, I'm a woman. So that is one of my identities is, is being a woman. Is anyone else comfortable sharing? A beater. <laughs> that friend's a beater. Our only interaction is with Catherine today, huh? Pig farmer. Oh, an athlete. A pig farmer, Muslim. All right, thank you. Thank you for sharing, and feel free to add the list throughout the presentation. <laughs> so advance the slide step. I'm a little goofy. I like it. Often when we do this activity, if we're in a room with people with disabilities, and I don't know if any of you have disabilities, um, but people usually don't list disability as one of their identities. Um, many times people think about a disability as a medical diagnosis, 
uh, my disability is a spinal cord injury or my disability is depression, my disability is a brain injury. Um, and when we're going to be talking about disability today, we're going to be thinking about it in a whole new way. We're not going to think about it as a medical diagnosis. Um, so we can advance this slide. So we're going to be talking about it in a completely different way. And that's me, Teresa, up on the screen for all of you to see. Um, and I'm a person with multiple invisible disabilities. So the screen says my disability is invisible, so why does it matter if I identify or have pride? And the reason that it's really important is because disability is more than the physical and our mental effects on the body. Um, and I'm going to talk about this, but disability is more than the pills that I take or the doctor that I go to. Um, it's actually a part of who I am. So we can advance to number. So on the screen, you see me, and there's all these little arrows out to several pictures. And I'm going to start with the one where I'm running. Um, it's on the top, kind of to the left. Um, and like I said, I have an invisible disability. I have a mental health disability that I acquired um, in my 20s, early 20s, when I was in college. And um, before I had my disability, I was an athlete, but I never ran. And I found out after I acquired my disability that if I ran in the morning, it reduced my stress all day long. And um, because I acquired my disability, I would run a lot more. And I ended up running my first half marathon. Um, this past year. And um, before I had my mental health disability, I would have never ran that half marathon. So um, my mental health disability has really made me into a runner. Um, my disability has affected who I vote for, um, the kind of causes I think are important. Um, I think mental health parity is really important, and that's something I would have never known anything about before I acquired my mental health disability. Um, so it's affected me as a voter. So it's more than just a pill that I take, it's affecting the way I vote. Um, after I acquired my disability, I started getting really involved in disability activism, and that has given me the opportunities to travel across the country um, and talk to different people with disabilities, and I have met the coolest people since I've acquired my disability. So there's a picture of me with some friends that I've made, so it's introduced me to a whole community. Um, it's affected the way I eat. Um, I have found out that um, if I reduce my sugar and my caffeine, um, my carbs, um, I will do much better with my anxiety throughout the day. Uh, before I acquired my disability, I was not a cook. I didn't cook at home. Um, I would slap together a sandwich sometimes. But um, since I don't want to eat out and eat all that sugar, I've learned that I actually do have cooking abilities, and it's made me a cook. Um, it affects the relationships that I have. Um, that's my boyfriend up there. <laughs> so it affects the way that I interact with him. And one of the biggest things about um, having disability pride or recognizing disability as a part of who I am, it makes it so I don't have to lie to people if I'm able to say I have a disability. And one of the examples that I give is that um, if I start dating someone, and um, I don't tell them I have a disability. I go to the doctors every week. So let's say I go to the doctors, and my boyfriend calls, and he's like, hey, what are you doing? And since I don't want to tell him, I'm like, I'm at the grocery store. And um, he's like, oh, great. Why don't you pick up some chicken for dinner, and why don't we cook? And so if I don't tell him where I am, I've now told him I'm at the grocery store, so I lied to him. And now I have to leave the parking lot of the doctor's office, drive to the grocery store, pick up the chicken, and then drive all the way home. So um, it really allows you to not lie and live a life of a lie and also saves all that gas driving back and forth. <laughs> so um, the next thing is that I, um, when I acquired my mental health disability, I spent a lot of money, um, and then when those bills came in, I was afraid of them, and I wouldn't open them. Um, so because of that, I've realized this is a big issue in the mental health community and disability community in general is handling money, um, and it's made me really passionate about helping other people in the mental health community in particular deal with bills and deal with financial situations. So it's given me the opportunity to help other people in the same situation as me. Um, 
One of the other things that's affected is my relationships with family members. Um, both of, almost everyone in my family has a physical disability. Um, it's my little brother there. Um, he identifies as deaf. Um, and um, so it's affected the way that my family interacts with each other and learning about invisible disabilities. Um, the next way it's affected my life more than just the doctor's appointments, more than the pills, um, is that it's affected the things I advocate for and making me realize that I do have a voice. Um, um, the picture itself is me holding a megaphone and the word pride is coming out of it. Um, before I acquired my disability, I don't think I would have known that I had the ability to go out on the street and yell for disability rights. We were doing a action for getting a ramp into a building. Um, and I don't know if I knew that girl, that woman, existed in me before I had my mental health disability. It's a change the way I, all the paths I've taken in my life. I went to college, I got sick in college, um, I left college, I started a job at a disability organization, I went back to college, I'm in college now. So it's affected all these paths in my life and the places that I've moved. So it's been more than that diagnosis. It's really affected my whole life path. Um, it's affected the job that I have, which is the last picture of the girl sitting there that says voice. I'm very, very passionate about girls with disabilities. Um, and because of that and because of having my own disability, I've been able to incorporate that into my work and my job. I work at a disability rights organization, but I also run a program for girls with disabilities. So I've been able to um, incorporate that. So um, it's more than all those, the pill and the doctor. It's all of those things, the things that I'm involved in, the way I vote, the relationships, the person that I am. So it's all of those things. We can go on. Um, before we totally transition, that the things that Teresa talked about um, being affected in her life because of her disability were also very positive things. Um, and we're going to talk more about that, but I just wanted to make sure that I noted that those were um, things that have um, brought joy to her life, new skills that she has acquired, um, deeper, authentic relationships with the people in her life, um, and accomplishments and things that have been um, gifts, I think is fair to say, mm -hmm. in, in your life. So um, I just wanted to point that out. So taking what Teresa was just describing and how we're talking about this philosophical shift of, of disability being more than a medical diagnosis, um, I want you to think of an analogy, think of a koosh ball. Um, there's a picture of one on the screen. A koosh ball is a hard rubber band core center, and it has all these little pieces of rubber band sticking out all around it. And here I am doing the visual in my hand because that's what I'm so used to doing and there's nobody here to look at it. Um, <laughs> but it's a, there's this hard rubber band center and there are all of these little rubber bands, uh, pieces of rubber bands sticking out all over it. And I want you to think about that as yourself and your, um, the center, that hard rubber band core is being the essence of who you are. That is your whole self. It is when you feel most comfortable, most safe, uh, most authentic. Um, that is who you are. And each of those little rubber bands that are sticking out, each one is a different identity that makes up who you are. Um, each one is attached to the core of who you are. It makes up, you can't have a strand without the core, and you can't have the core without a strand, right? So, um, you kind of sort of think about that. And what happens if you pick up um, a koosh ball by just one identity, what actually happens is the core of that ball drops. Um, I don't know if people know what I'm talking about. I'm hoping that you can get the idea, but it actually falls down. And we use this analogy because we're saying that 
disability is one of those rubber bands, right? It's one of the things that make us who we are, but it's not the only thing that makes us who we are. If we focus only on one identity, only on our gender, only on our religion, only on our sexual orientation, we're going to lose the essence of who we are because we are now, that core has dropped. Um, but at the same time, we can't be our whole selves without acknowledging and, and, and naming and accepting all of these little rubber bands that are attached to who we are. Um, so um, we really want you to sort of keep that in mind um, as an analogy as we, as we move forward. And we can advance this slide 12. Uh, to expand on what we mean by this, uh, I picked a different identity. This is a picture of me in the center. Um, and I chose the identity of being a woman. And I'm going to talk about uh, how being a woman affects so much more than just, it's not just my gender, I'm a woman, but it actually affects all of these areas of my life. So I will um, start with my relationship. Um, being a woman is going to affect who um, I hang out with, who, um, who my friends are, who I'm attracted to possibly, um, who I, I want to hang out with people who have similar values that I do. Um, so I'll definitely want to be paying attention and, and it'll affect who I'm hanging out with. Um, being a woman affects the type of media that I am interested in. It affects what I think is funny. I can go to a comedy club and not laugh because of me thinking that all of these things that are actually kind of sexist or whatever, in my opinion, I can't take off that hat because I consider myself a feminist and I don't find those kinds of things funny. Um, it may also affect the type of books that I read. I just recently got another Bell Hooks book, you know, and I'm going to be looking at how patriarchy plays out in my relationship. <laughs> um, it affects the, the picture out there is actually of a spoken word artist, Alex Olsen, who is a feminist. And I use the type of uh, her poetry and her spoken word stuff to sort of motivate me to move forward in the feminist movement and also has inspired me to write some of my own pieces. Um, the next picture, it talks about how I, being a woman affects the hobbies and activities that I do. There's a, a picture of me actually reading some of my poetry pieces on a stage about being a woman um, and how I have internalized sexism and how I have fought back against that um, and reclaimed the color pink. And then underneath that is a picture of me in the cast of the Vagina Monologues. And that was, I was in the Vagina Monologues for two years when I was in college, and I directed it the year after that. And I, that was one of the best experiences of my life. Like, I had no idea. I had never had any, taken a theater class. I had never been interested in even being on stage or doing anything like that. Um, and because I am a woman and was passionate about ending sexual violence and domestic violence and abuse against women, um, I got to be part of something that was um, really amazing. The next thing is where I vacation. Being a woman affects where I want to go and what I want to do. There's a picture of me with some friends at a women's music festival, which is something that is a huge escape for me. Um, that if I was a man, I wouldn't be able to go to. <laughs> and it's all women's voices and all women's music and women's crafts, and I'm just surrounded by women, and that really gives me this sense of community and, um, you know, sort of fuels me to, to, to keep going and affirms who I am as a person and makes me feel really proud of being a woman and being part of that community. Being a woman affects my health care, what type of health care I need, how I am perceived by health care, um, professionals. It makes me want to sort of challenge the healthcare um, profession and the um, type of sexism that exists within um, within that system. And that's a picture of me. I, I have a spinal cord injury. I guess I probably haven't said that yet. Um, 
And so I have been in and out of the hospital multiple times, and I have definitely been able to see the way that my gender um, has affected my time in the hospital and my interactions with people. The next thing is it affects my education. Um, I took a lot of women's studies classes, and um, the things that I wanted to learn about and how I was able to, um, I have my master's in social work, and I was able to really take feminism and put it into all of the work, um, you know, into my papers and apply that to, you know, the things and concepts that I was learning and the theories that I was learning. It affects my ability to have children. I have a son who is going to turn one in a couple weeks. Um, and so I think that that is a huge gift of being a woman is, um, being able to bring a life into this world and have that connection with another human being. Uh, let's see, the next one is issues in politics. As Teresa said, she's really passionate about mental health parity because of her disability. Well, because I am a woman, I am very passionate about women's justice um, and ending sexual violence and domestic violence and abuse against women. There's a picture of me there doing civil disobedience. Um, and also a picture of me skydiving. And when I, um, I skydived as part of a fundraiser to raise money for a domestic violence shelter in my area. So that is something I don't know that I would have done had I not see a woman and not be involved um, in that movement. And then the last thing up there that I had mentioned is that being a woman affects the sports and recreation that I am involved with. I'm gonna be, um, you know, on women's teams and be connected in, in women's um, sports and meet other women athletes. Um, that is something, again, that I just really consider a gift being able to be a part of women's communities. So with that, we will advance, make that analogy a little bit clearer. Okay. So um, like we said, we can pull out those identities and really look at them, but we're not. We encourage you to um, possibly do this activity on your own, and if you do have a disability, um, encourage you to possibly think about doing it with your disability identity. Advance the slide. So, um, one of the things that Teresa and I do here at MDRC is we work to try to develop leadership amongst people with disabilities and within the disability community. And one of the things that we really noticed is that um, in the process of doing that is that a lot of people with disabilities did not see themselves as leaders. And uh, we found out that the reason after a, a lot of really getting at it and years of really just poking around at it, figured out that they really lacked the sense of disability pride and power. And what I mean by that is that they didn't feel proud of who they were and they didn't think that their voice mattered. And so uh, we put together a committee, an ad hoc committee that was a diverse group of people. Um, we had family members, all different sexual orientations, ages, um, and they came together and really talked about, okay, so what is disability pride and what is disability power? And if we can advance. The definition that they came up with for disability pride is that it is accepting and honoring our uniqueness and seeing it as a natural and beautiful part of human diversity. And they talked about pride really coming from celebrating our heritage, disability culture, the unique experiences that we have as people with disabilities, and the contributions that we can give to society. The committee really struggled with um, this concept of disability power because a lot of times we had used the word empowerment um, kept coming to mind. And when you look up the word empower in the dictionary, it really implies that someone is giving up some of their power and giving it to someone else. And so there's this imbalance of power, and someone, this power dynamic, that someone has more power than the other, and to empower them means they're going to give up some of theirs to give to that person. And the committee really didn't, that didn't sit well with us. Um, the committee really felt that people with disabilities already had their own power, 
that what they needed to be empowered was to find their own voice. And their, the power was within them, and they just needed to figure out that they had it and how they could use that for change. And so um, the committee uses the term self-empowerment. And they define that as knowing and feeling one's pride, which we just talked about, and applying our unique voices, skills, and actions with energy and confidence to achieve a vision. And that vision is full citizenship in all places in their life. So that can be personal relationships, in their home, in their school, in their work, in their community, in whatever institutions they are part of, et cetera. So hopefully those definitions make sense. We can move to five. So why, why we're talking about this um, concept of disability pride and power and why it is so important is because there's um, what happens when we live in this world of negative messages all the time and people telling us that disability is something to be ashamed of and something that needs to be cured and something that needs to be fixed is that we internalize that. We call that ableism, that's the oppression um, that people with disabilities face. And what happens is we internalize that and we actually start feeling those things about us. And we start feeling, oh, well, I'm never gonna get a job, um, you know, because there's just so many barriers out there and I'm not good enough and they're never gonna apply, you know, give me the accommodations that I need. And, you know, I'm just never going to be able to do that, or I'm just not good enough, or until I can, you know, overcome this or do that, um, you know, that, that, that we just beat ourselves up and we start becoming so ashamed of who we are. And disability pride and power is really about rejecting those negative messages. Um, and really saying, no, I am, I am okay. I am just one part of diversity, and that that part of diversity is beautiful and natural, and it's not something that um, that, need, that I need to be ashamed of. So we can advance this. So my students with disabilities say they feel that way. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. um, we hear that a lot. <laughs> yes, we do hear that a lot about students. <laughs> Um, hopefully this is going to help a little. Um, we're going to watch a short video. Um, one of the things that Melinda and I think is very important is honoring the voices of the disability community. Um, and we want people to understand that disability pride and power um, is more than a Melinda and Teresa thing. Um, it's not like our own idea that this is a community's idea. And um, so we wanted to bring the voices of family members and other people with disabilities into the, um, well, I usually say room, but into the webinar. Um, <laughs> into virtual space. space. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we could watch this video. Okay, just give me just a minute. I'm going to move the mic back over here. Um, we're going to be linking to MDR, Michigan Disability Rights Coalition's uh, YouTube channel. Um, once I do that, the video will start right away. I don't know with different internet speeds um, that we're all going to get done at the same time. So if, um, if you don't get all the way to the end and we, we switch it on you, you, you will have the link uh, to go back and watch it again later. But hopefully this will work. This is kind of an experiment for us. So here we go. Let me check my speakers. Okay, here we go. Um, so what we really want to talk about now is how one gets to this sense of disability pride and power, what this journey um, or philosophical shift might look like for uh, people with disabilities. And I think that the same thing can be said if we look at other identities that we might have, how we might be able to get to a sense of pride about other identities that we have as well. So. Um, it sort of applies across the board, and we can advance. We sort of look at people sort of going through a, a set of four tiers, is what we call them, the tiers of pride. And the first one is acknowledgement. And what we mean by this is that what, 
we are acknowledging their disability as part of our identity. We are acknowledging that disability is one of the rubber band strands on our koosh ball. And we are getting rid of those messages that are telling us, oh, we're just special. Or you're just like everyone else. Um, you know, that we are just the same as everyone else. We're just a little bit special or whatever the negative messages might be. And say, no, we are different than everyone else. And that we are okay because that difference is just a, a beautiful natural part of human diversity. When someone is in this acknowledgement here, this is about being able to say, I am disabled or I have a disability to myself and to other people that are around me. So it could be um, if you have an invisible disability, it could be about being able to self-identify to other people instead of trying to pass as someone who doesn't have a disability. Um, and we'll talk more about this later, but this can also be about acknowledging that the assistive technology that we use and being able to use that uh, to take that piece of assistive technology out into public and use it at a meeting, use it at a restaurant, use it um, where other people can see you utilize that, that assistive technology. Kind of advance to slide 21. The second tier, the tiers of pride, is community. And this is a really important one that I touched a lot about, at least within my gender, uh, when I did my, my chart is this is where you're realizing that you're not the only one and you're finding a place that you fit in, a place that you feel that you can be your whole self, you can be that core where you realize that there are other people who are like you, who experience the similar barriers from society that you do. Um, you have that shared understanding of the oppression that you face um, and having that, those common experiences. And something like this can be, uh, at the example that I give of how important this can be is my husband does not identify, at least not yet, we're still working on that, um, <laughs> as someone with a disability. Um, and he does definitely, well, he has knee problems, but he doesn't have, he still won't say he has a physical disability either. So um, when I come home after a day of facing all of this ableism around my physical disability and I'm extremely frustrated and I'm venting about what just happened, um, my husband Dominic can do everything that he thinks he can do to try to empathize with me, to try to understand what I went through. But ultimately he does not face those barriers. He doesn't have to worry about finding a van accessible parking spot with HD grid lines on the side so that I don't get trapped in my car. You know, he doesn't have to worry about those kinds of issues and the barriers that I face. So on one hand, it feels good to talk to him about it, but there is something different when I could call up Teresa or my friend Laura or someone else who is in the disability community who truly gets and understands and has a similar experience that I do in facing that ableism on a daily basis. So community can be huge in helping us um, develop that sense of pride. And Teresa can, you know, sort of remind me, hey, it's not your fault. You know, it is not because you have a disability that is causing this to be a negative situation. That is because, you know, this society is putting this barrier out there. And if they would just, you know, be up in compliance and have more accessible parking, you wouldn't have this issue. That it's not about you and your physical body that is causing you to face this ableism at this point. And I say physical body because I'm talking about my physical disability. Um, but she can help me realize that it's not about me, that, that the issue here is society. I'm going to advance to slide 22. So the third one is um, realizing that you're part of a larger movement. Um, this is the most exciting one to me because I'm a history dork. Um, so it's learning about disability history and realizing that people with disabilities are um, both part of an oppressed group, oppressed being that society discriminates in some way against you, um, and uh, that we're part of an oppressed group, but we've also resisted that oppression throughout history, that um, people with and without disabilities have tried to make 
things equal for people with disabilities. Um, and two examples that I give is learning that people with disabilities um, were the first victims of the Holocaust, some of the first ones, and that we were discriminated against in that way. But also learning that we've resisted oppression by um, people with disabilities have the record for the longest sitting of a federal building when they were fighting for Section 504 to be passed. To me, that's really exciting, learning our history. Um, so looking at how far we've come over the years and realizing how long people in the community have been fighting for equality. We can advance to 23. So the last tier is pride. Um, being able to say, I'm just disabled, um, which is a little different than the acknowledgement level where you're just saying it, but also having a sense of pride when you say it. Um, being Feeling good when you tell someone you have a disability, um, using your community's history as fuel to move forward, and feeling great power and excitement when you're around a large group of people with disabilities. So we can advance to slide 24. Okay, so there's many things to gain um, by having disability pride. It increases your self-esteem and your self-acceptance. Um, it gives you a support system. It makes you realize that you belong. It helps you connect to um, a community. Um, it helps you ask for accommodations, which is really big for this um, assistive technology. Being able to say, I need something, um, and it's not something that's special or a favor that someone is giving us, that it's your right to have an accommodation, um, and being able to ask for that. Um, it's got the value of interdependence. Um, when we talk about disability pride, a lot of times in the disability community, community we use the word independent, so we want people to be independent. Um, we prefer to use the word interdependent um, or having interdependency uh, because we believe that nobody um, is completely independent, that all of us, no matter if you have a disability or not, depend on other people for things. Um, and that's a real gift the disability can give the rest of the world is realizing that we all rely on each other and that we all can ask for help sometimes and that's a okay and um, natural part of life is depending on each other. Um, that you live that life of honesty. Um, so not having to lie or cover up your disability like I talked about earlier, not having to go buy chicken um, while I'm at a doctor's appointment because of just telling my boyfriend I'm going to a doctor's appointment. That's where I am right now. Um, so not having to lie. Um, and having appreciation for diversity, sometimes when you realize that you are um, part of a group that's oppressed and that you've um, resisted oppression and you get an appreciation for diversity in different um, groups that have been oppressed and you can learn about the history of all the social movements. Can you move to slide 25? Now we would like to just quickly take you through how uh, to help yourself, how to help people you work with, how to help your family members, other people with disabilities that you interact with, move to that sense of disability pride, how to help them get through those tiers. And we call these the building blocks of pride. We can advance to the first building block is that of acknowledgement. And what we mean by that is acknowledging, um, helping people acknowledge their disability identity. Um, introducing them to people who are proud, um, you know, using the word disabled, using the word disability instead of trying to sugarcoat it or try to, um, you know, call it something that it's actually not. But when you start looking at disability as something that is more than just a medical diagnosis, it makes it a little bit easier to start talking about disability um, and actually using the big D word. Um, it's also about acknowledging the losses that come with having a disability um, and as well are the gifts and acknowledging those gifts. And just a quick story is there is an author named Eli Clare who has cerebral palsy and he walks with what he calls a gimp. And I went to a retreat that he did for people with disabilities. And we talked about losses and gifts, and he talked about how it was so important to realize that with every loss comes a gift. 
And the example that he gave is he talked about how people around him that he knew who did not have a gimp could just go hiking up a mountain and hike all the way up to the top. And he said, that's a real loss for me that I can't do that. And I need to be able to honor the fact that that's a loss. I need to be able to feel the sadness around that. However, it's really important that I don't get stuck there. And instead that I acknowledge that loss, I feel that sadness, but then I move to realize that there's a gift that comes with the loss. And the gift that comes with that loss for him was that he could crawl up the mountain. And when he crawled up that mountain, he could look at every rock and crevice and small plant and pebble and stone that was on the ground that the people who were hiking up the mountain didn't see because of that height difference. Um, and I, that was really powerful. And, and I think that a lot of times what happens is, you know, we have the whole world every day pointing out every negative thing that has to do with disability, right? And um, being able to acknowledge the gift is something that is really important. We need to take the time to point out the gift in the people with disabilities lives that are around us because everyone else is pointing out the negative, right? So now it's our turn to help them realize that there actually is something positive that comes with that. Um, Amy, I see your question up in the corner about the word diversibility. We're actually gonna have the next slide be on language and so I'm gonna let um, Teresa talk about that so we can move to slide 27. Okay. Um like Melinda said, the next thing is looking at language. You can go to slide 28. So language matters. Um, if we're going to talk about disability pride, we should use the word disability. Um, and as we talked about earlier, we're talking about it as like an identity and not so much the um, medical diagnosis. So we're saying people have disabilities, like, or they are disabled. Um, we think that these words don't encourage um, disability pride, crippled or handicapped or special or um, barrier, normal, can't, differently abled. Um, so the words that are up there we're saying are not good words to use. Sometimes people think that we're giving them examples of good words. I just wanted to be clear. Um, one of the reasons special is up there, and some people question that, and I think it's important to point out that special sometimes is used around the word accommodation. Um, what are your special needs? Um, and we don't use the word special because it denies the fact that accommodations are someone's right and that people fought for that right. Um, and so it's not a special need. It's not a gift or a favor. It's an actual, that is your right. Um, when we say barrier, we're looking at the fact that it's, there's societal barriers in front of people and not that the person with a disability is a barrier. Um, to go to Amy's question um, about the word diversibility, is, I don't know, is that a word that they use for people with disabilities? I don't know if Amy's still there. Um, Okay. Um, did you want to answer that? I don't know what the word is. <laughs> oh, there she goes. In the education community. Okay. As for a person with a disability. So the question is, what about the word diversibility for people to call someone with a disability? Um, I would say that we wouldn't really encourage that word because we're really strong about using our personal opinion is using the word disability because um, we're not saying that everyone is alike. We're saying disability is something that makes us different. Like we don't, we are alike in that we're all human, but then when we look at humans, there's male and female, and she's and he's and sometimes others. But um, when we're talking about disability, we're talking about people with disabilities and people without disabilities. It's not just doing something different, it's also all of those things that we talked about earlier, uh, affecting the way we vote, that, that core self, not being able to be its core self without having all those strands, including disability. So we're saying that's an identity and not just the way we do things. So um, I would say that we would use the word disability, not diversability. And this is Melinda, and I just want to add to 
that in the sense that one of the things that is really important for the work that Teresa and I do is really honoring the voice of the disability community mm -hmm. and using the labels that they're choosing because historically people with disabilities have not had input into how they are being referred. And it is the quote unquote helping professionals that have been, or the medical professionals who have been giving them the labels. And so um, we really want to start listening to the community themselves. And you will see that, you know, there's diversity within any community, right? And so I'm sure you're going to meet other people who are going to say, don't call me disabled. And they're going to say the opposite of everything that we say today. Um, and that's okay. I just think that um, it's really important to look at history and to look at the community as a whole and to look at the community geographically as well as nationally um, and how they are choosing to refer to themselves and make sure that we are honoring what it is that they want to call themselves and not, um, not just using the language that non-disabled people are using, if that makes sense. And to add on to that, um, if you look at the national organizations or local organizations that are ran by people with disabilities, they're using the word disability. Um, you know, the American Association of People with Disabilities or Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. Um, people with disabilities are choosing that as part of who they are and so honoring that language. So if we go on to slide, um, looks at history and culture. We go on. Oh, I'll wait till the slide to load. Okay, well, it doesn't look like that one's going to load. Um, but like we talked about earlier, learning that you're part of a movement, and that can be only learned if um, we give people opportunities to learn about um, disability history and culture. Um, so up there are two pictures. It's on there. Okay, there's two pictures. There's one of a man in a hat sitting um, in his wheelchair, and it says injustice everywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, and that's Justin Dart. So learning about Justin Dart, um, who some consider the father of um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which gave um, people with disabilities their legal, legal rights. Um, the other picture is Nadina Lespina, and she's sitting in her wheelchair, um, and if you can see it, it says she's got her prosthetic legs up on her shoulders, um, and what it says below her is, I'd rather wear my legs as wings. So learning about the culture and the history, um, learning those things I talked about earlier, that you know people with disabilities were the first victims of the Holocaust, or that people with disabilities had the longest sit-in. So learning those things um, and helping people get resources to them. Um, someone earlier mentioned that they, their students didn't feel proud a lot. Um, one of the sad things about our school system is they don't teach disability history and culture in a school system. We learn about different histories, but we don't learn about the history of people with disabilities. So if you do work with students, giving them information about disability history um, could be their only opportunity. You giving that to them may be their only opportunity to learn it. Um, and um, since two people have said things about students, um, I would just say that if you do work with students, when you give it to them, they might look at you like, why would I want this? This is more schoolwork or this isn't interesting. But um, you should realize that you're just planting that seed because later down the line they may realize, wow, I remember that teacher told me I had a history. Um, because I know for me, when I learned history in high school, I was never interested in what I was learning. But then later on in life, I knew that I had rights, and I knew that women could vote because people fought for that right. Um, so that's the same with disability. If you teach people that they have rights and there's a history, later down the line they're going to pull on that and draw on that. If you go on the slide. So the last block is, um, is this the last block? Second to last. Second last is inclusion. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, the last one's inclusion is creating inclusive programs, um, so allowing people with disabilities to be involved in programs that are for people with and without disabilities, but also allowing um, people with disabilities to be involved by choice with um, groups that allow them to be introduced to their community members. Um, so making sure that people are introduced to different communities.
so we can go on. The last building block is, uh, we call that practicing, and we can move to slide 34. This is sort of a two, a two fold building block. On one hand, we, if we are encouraging people around us, students, family members, friends, ourselves, whatever, um, about, if we're encouraging them to take on this sense of disability pride and the sense of disability identity, we also have to believe it ourselves. People with disabilities are very smart and they can tell when people um, are sitting there saying, oh yeah, you know, you're going to, you got to set these goals for yourself for when you transition out of high school and you're going to be able to go on to college and you're going to be able to do that. And if you don't, as you're saying that, if you don't really mean it and you're thinking, yeah, they're really going to fail, but I'm just saying this so that they have, you know, a, a, an outcome on their IEP, they're going to know that. They can see that. Um, we can see through when people actually are pitying us or, um, don't believe in that sense of disability pride and identity. So it's very important that if we are going to be teaching that, that we need to believe it ourselves. We need to be practicing what we're preaching, so to say. Um, also, on the other hand, the, the second fold of this is um, helping the people around you within your organization uh, and in your communities believe this concept as well. If, if you're working in a service organization, um, or a school system, and you are the only one that is believing in disability pride and the only one teaching that and the only one giving that message, um, it's not going to give them very many opportunities to practice that sense of disability pride. Um, there, it's going to be very difficult for them to get a consistent message. So we really want to make sure that, that everyone who is in this person's sort of sphere of influence is, is assisting and believing what it is that we're actually teaching. And I see that Kathy McAdam thinks that that's very important too. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and so we also want to give them lots of opportunities to be practicing it for themselves, but then we need to be practicing it on our own as well. And the, the quote that is up on the screen says, remember you weren't the one who made you ashamed, but you are the one who can make you proud. Just practice. Practice until you get proud. And once you are proud, keep practicing so you won't forget. You get proud by practicing. And that's part of a pro poem that's called You Proud by Practicing that Laura Hershey, who's a person with a disability, wrote. It is really powerful. So um, in essence, we're going to sort of shift into talking more about AT now, but I think I just want to reiterate that it is why we spent so much time on this is because it, we really need to make this philosophical shift in how we view disability to be able to have any kind of pride, and we'll talk more about this, in our AT. So um, there really was thought into why we have spent this time, and I really hope that you're finding this useful and helpful in um, being able to shift how you're viewing yourself, how you're viewing your own identities, as well as the people around you that you work with or family members. We can advance to slide 35. Okay. So, um, like Melinda said, we're looking at changing the way we think about AT as well. The AT is a right and that it's nothing special, so it's um, an accommodation, and there should be no shame in using or asking for AT. Um, and that through disability pride, we're able to use our AT in public and not be ashamed of it. Um, Two quick stories to kind of connect this all is um, we ran a camp for girls with disabilities and we had a conversation about assistive technology and their lives. And um, one of the things that I really took from that conversation, why disability pride was so important is for some people, depending on their disability and their assistive technology, the assistive technology is such a part of an extension of their body and it plays into their body image, and it plays into self-esteem. And so if you're ashamed of using that, or you think that disability is something to hide, and you can't hide that part of your body or extension of your body, you're not going to use that, or you're going to feel really bad every time someone sees it. So it's so important that we have disability pride so that people, we encourage disability pride so people will use their assistive technology. Um, there was a facilitator with us 
that um, is legally blind. And she said that um, in college she had large print books made for her and that she would always hide these large print books in her closet. Every time she got them, she just shoved them in the closet and she would struggle through classes. Um, and if she couldn't find the text somehow online, she just wouldn't use the text and she would just go to class and never read the book because she was ashamed to bring out this large print book. And now that she has disability pride, she just really encouraged people to think about what is it in your closet that you hide from the world and how do we bring those things out by having disability pride and how can we really use them in public without being ashamed. I want to add, can I add one yeah. more thing um, also in there is that I, when we start having this philosophical shift in how we view disability and how we view AC, it can also really, as Teresa said, help us be more comfortable in asking for and using that AC. And I think of people that I know whose family members, I mean, family members play a huge role in, all, in a lot of our lives and um, as far as accepting and, and um, acknowledging who we are. And I know a lot of people who have disabilities that maybe um, progress or that you start out thinking you can use crutches and then you move on to something else. And, and, and because society is teaching us and because the medical diagnosis or whatever is telling us that AT is bad, AT is a sign of weakness, AT is, um, means you're dependent on something and therefore less than. Um, we are so reluctant to use what it is that we need. And when we start viewing AT as something that in, in disability, as part of our identities, as part of extensions of our bodies, as things that are positive, things that give us freedom, things that help us, um, that are our rights um, and help us achieve the things that we want to in our life, it is then when we can actually start um, using the AT without that shame, without that wanting to run and hide and put your books in a closet feeling. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Right. So we can go on to slide. Okay, we're going to go through some AT, um, but while we go over these, <laughs> I wanted you to know that um, we're not talking so much about covering up the AT as much as um, putting it out there and celebrating it. Um, so what we have up here is a young child that has um, a trach necklace um, designed for him or her. Um, we also have a little clip that comes in so many different kinds. Uh, it was hard to choose a picture of, um, for hearing aids that goes above the ear. Our neck, oh, sorry. 37. All right, um, the next, the, this slide is a cane that has fire coming up it. If you watch House, it's House's cane. Um, <laughs> that uh, really is expressive of this person's pride. Um, up there, we also have a quote that says, before I had disability pride and came to this training, I left my cane at the door. After leaving, Learning about disability pride, I came back from lunch and grabbed my cane and brought it to the table with me. I'm proud to use my cane. And this quote came from a woman that came to our training about disability pride, and she said that every time she enters the building, she puts her coat and her cane in the corner. Um, and then she would try to get to her seat, and then she would never do the activities where you move around or anything because she didn't have her cane with her. Um, and after learning about disability pride, she realized that there's no reason to stick the cane in the corner, that she could just bring it with her and she shouldn't be ashamed of having it leaned up against the table. Um, so that cane is an example. Um, the next ones are wheels that blink. Um, when you roll on them, they light up in different colors. Um, and then also wheel covers that are decorated blinged out wheels. And as someone who uses a wheelchair, I must say that I have had, I've taken great pride in attaching bumper stickers about disability um, all over my chair. <laughs> and I think that, you know, depending on the size of the AT, that that's another thing that you can do is express the disability culture mm -hmm. uh, in disability pride through your AT. So we have page 
um, the expression through prosthetics. We have one prosthetic that is decorated for, I believe, Chicago. Um, and then we have a adaptive device decoration for a hand prosthetic. Very fancy. Yes. Yeah. And um, we also have an adaptive cutting device and a fancy adaptive golf cart. I've never seen such a fancy one, but it is extremely fancy as one who has used one who loves to golf. <laughs> <laughs> so our next slide, we just really want you to think about um, what things, what AT do you leave in your closet that you need? Because I just think that without pride, a lot of people are hiding something that may be very useful to them. So we go on to two. I'm glad that you heard it, Amy. <laughs> so um, that sort of that concludes what we are here to talk about. We wanted to make sure that we left some time for questions. Um, reactions to what we've been saying because this is something that is drastically different than the message that you're hearing um, from the real world out from the daily whatever um, negative messages that you get. So we would really like to open it up to hear some comments or questions from the chat area. You have students that hide your AT? I think that's pretty common. Yeah. Very common for people to do that. And I think that's why it's really important to be thinking about those building blocks of pride and the tiers of pride and how we can help our students move through those and build their sense of pride so that um, AT isn't something that they're ashamed of. And, it, and we can demonstrate that as people with disabilities or as educators um, by starting to, to really show that and give them the messages that this is their right, that they're not asking for something special, and that it's okay to be using it in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And another reason why I think using the word disability or disabled is important, um, because it recognizes it's a part of who they are, um, and that difference is a good thing. I think sometimes we use words where we say we're all the same, but I know I'm different, and if you're not acknowledging why I'm different, then it must be a bad thing um, because you're trying to hide it from me and the rest of the world. So um, that's why using that word disability and difference is a good thing. It's part of human diversity, and it's natural. Any other comments? Um, important to share our own journeys and stories. I agree so much, Kathy. I think that that is... Um, one of the, the tipping points, I think, or the starting points in, in people's journeys to having a disability identity and really claiming that um, is hearing and meeting other people that have done that and have gone through that uh, process. It's really important. We all look up to people for one reason or another, right, or have some kind of mentors or people that we um, appreciate or admire. And a lot of times it's because they have shared some kind of story with them that, that mm -hmm. we find really useful or important in our life. And if we can help other people do that, that'd be great. So, other questions, comments? I wonder if we could, this is Catherine, I just wanted to point out that if you're looking for resources on disability history or any of the other issues that Melinda and Teresa have brought up today, um, in our follow-up email we will put a direct link to their section of the web page, which is leadership, and you'll find many resources there. I'm going to change to slide 40. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Joanne. I want to thank everyone for completing the online survey that I will send you afterwards. I'll also include a link to our YouTube channel in case you didn't get to see the video all the way through, so you'll have an easy way to just click. Um, and I will put you on an email list, and I don't want to be spamming you, so if you don't want to be on the list, let me know. 
uh, to receive information about um, future assistive technology webinar opportunities that we have. And I want to uh, thank you very much. And I, I also want to thank our wide participation in this webinar. We had somebody from Hawaii <laughs> and Canada who went international this time. So um, within a, a few weeks uh, or sooner, I will be sending you a notice to let you know when the recording is available on our web page. Um, so that will be your first email from the, from the list, probably. Thank you so much. Thank you.